Thanks very much, Harvey. Let's see if this is on. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. It is a pleasure to be here, I have to say. I um, was at Slack in the 80s. I see some of my, the gray beards in the audience that I remember as, uh, as good, good old friends from those days. And uh, it's just always a pleasure to be back here at Stanford. Okay, so I'm going to, I've got a lot of things to talk about, um, about uh, some of the recent um, observations of gravitational waves made by uh, LIGO. So let's get started with um, Gravitational Waves 101, because I assume that not everybody here is an expert on the subject. So let me, I just need to remind you of some of the properties, well, what gravitational waves are, and the properties that we expect them to have. So. Uh, uh, Matter, according to Einstein, matter and energy cause space and time to curve. That's manifest, that manifests gravity. And if matter and energy are accelerating, uh, then they will uh, ch change the gravitational field dynamically. And the news of the rapidly changing uh, gravitational field will propagate outward at the speed of light uh, as gravitational waves. Gravitational waves have nothing whatsoever to do with light, so if they travel at the speed of light, that tells us more about space-time than it does about matter, energy, and, uh, uh, and the form of the energy. Uh, in other words, it travels at the fastest speed sustainable by space-time. And light, light um, shares the same property. Um, the, uh, the equations of general relativity Let's see, I think I have a decent... The equations of general relativity, these are Einstein's field equations, are pretty darn complicated uh, to solve, um, in the, even in the absence of matter on the right-hand side. In general relativity, matter and energy tells space and time how to curve, and space-time curvature tells matter and energy how to move. Even in the absence of matter, and en uh, of matter uh, so this right-hand side is zero, you still have dynamical space-time curvature, and gravitational waves from black holes are um, vacuum solutions to Einstein's field field equations. Um, some of the basic properties as predicted by general relativity is that um, uh, gravitational waves um, uh, uh, will propagate at the speed of light. They stretch and squeeze the space between objects. So by measuring the distance between objects, we can uh, see the strain, uh, which is a unitless quantity that they uh, experience due to gravitational waves, due to the curvature of space and time between those objects. And um, uh, the, the, the disturbance propagates at the speed of light. In the language of quantum mechanics, uh, the graviton, the carrier of, the gravitational, of gravitational waves in the same way that a photon carries electromagnetic radiation, uh, the graviton would be massless. Um, the space-time distortions are transverse to the direction of propagation. So if the waves are propagating along the z-axis, they stretch space in the x-axis, squeeze space in the y-axis. It's a, it's a wave, so it alternates, uh, stretching and squeezing. And um, uh, because gravitational waves are described in general relativity as tensor fields, as opposed to vector fields, uh, the pattern of their polarizations, there are two of them, uh, plus and cross, and that are related to one another by a 45 degree rotation. And that's in contrast to dipole radiation from uh, electromagnetic sources uh, in which the two polarizations are 90 degrees apart because electromagnetic fields are vector fields. Uh, and so this is uh, in quantum language saying that the graviton is a spin two field. A massless spin two field would have two helicities, plus or minus two, and linear combinations of them are these plus and cross polarizations. I'm telling you all this, this is all theory. I'm an experimentalist. I trust Einstein, but I will verify. <laughs> okay, so the field equations admit to um, um, uh, wave-like propagating solutions. Uh, the tensor, the space-time tensor, here's the time axis and here's the spatial part of the space-time tensor, has these two polarizations, plus and cross. And what they do is stretch, and, and this is a strain, and what they do is stretch and squeeze space in uh, 45, uh, the two polarizations uh, in this pattern. And um, uh, the strength 
of the, the amplitude of the gravitational wave is, uh, of course, proportional to g and inversely proportional to the distance to the source. And it's also it's proportional to the quadrupole moment, the acceleration of the quadrupole moment. It's quadrupole radiation, not dipole radiation. And, um, and that's due to conservation laws, actually. And um, uh, this, so the strength can be calculated, so you know just how strong a wave would be from a distance, a source at some distance r uh, with uh, an accelerating quadrupole moment. And uh, one of the best sources of accelerating quadrupole moments are dumbbells or two stars just orbiting each other. And they, when those two stars orbit each other, they obey Kepler's laws to lowest order, which um, for a given mass uh, relates the, the frequency, the orbital frequency to the distance between the two stars, capital R. So when the two stars are close together, very close together, their orbital frequencies are very high, and the gravitational wave frequencies, it's quadrupole radiation, the gravitational wave frequencies is twice the orbital frequency. And so in order to get gravitational waves with frequencies in the, the band accessible to the detectors, our ground-based LIGO detectors, that I'll talk more about in a minute, um, uh, we, we need to look for gravitational waves um, with frequencies above, say, 20 hertz, which corresponds to orbital, uh, orbital frequencies of 10 hertz. So imagine stars orbiting each other 10 times a second. By Kepler's laws, they have to be just tens of kilometers apart. So these are not ordinary stars. These are compact stars, neutron stars or black holes that are formed when massive stars burn all their nuclear fuel and collapse into a compact object, blow out the outer layers uh, in a supernova, and leave behind this compact object. And if there are two of them in a binary, then you will end up naturally forming these kinds of systems. And they're very efficient gravitational wave emitters, but they are pretty rare. Uh, imagine uh, that they're probably therefore very far away. Uh, so if you put them at a distance on the order of two stellar mass objects separated by tens of kilometers orbiting by Kepler's law t tens of times or hundreds of times or a thousand times a second uh, and you put it far away like in the Andromeda galaxy maybe a megaparsec away you're talking about strains of 10 to the minus 21. That's a very very small number. Um, gravitational waves do come in all kinds of frequencies, not just the ones accessible to ground-based detectors. Um, lower frequency detectors, so in the millihertz band, lower frequency gravitational waves can be detected by uh, detectors in space. This is an a conce artist's conception of the laser interferometer space antenna, LISA, which we hope will fly in the next... Um, uh, in the next uh, 10 years, 15 years or so. The LIGO detectors have arms, they're Michelson interferometers, with arms that are four kilometers long. LISA has arms of four million kilometers long. Uh, on the other hand, you can make even longer arms sensitive to lower wavelength gravitational waves uh, if your arms are as long as many, many light years uh, from, for example, distant pulsars and use them as timers and uh, look for deviations in the timing associated with passing gravitational waves. So this is Arecibo. Um, I think it's still there, although the hurricane damaged it a bit. Um, uh, but um, uh, pulsar timing is sensitive to gravitational waves with nanohertz type uh, frequencies corresponding maybe to black holes, supermassive black holes in the core of uh, orbiting and uh, merging galaxies. And at the very longest wavelengths, lowest frequencies and longest wavelengths associated with the whole size of the universe, um, if these kinds of waves were around during the early moments of the universe, then uh, they would have frozen in uh, to the, the um, cosmic microwave background and be detectable today. And there was some hint, perhaps, a few years ago of, uh, of, that, of a detection, but it turned out to just be magnetic dust in our galaxy. So the hunt is still on. Uh, in all of these cases, we think that we are on the threshold of discovery, except for one in which we are past the threshold of discovery. That's the one I'm going to concentrate on in this talk. Okay, so the two LIGO detectors, LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, were built by, the, um, uh, by Caltech and MIT for the National Science Foundation. Uh, they are um, 3,000 kilometers apart. One is in southern Louisiana in the swamps of southern Louisiana. The other is in the high dry desert of, uh, of Hanford, um, uh, eastern Washington state. It's uh, where um, uh, uh, a lot of the work associated with uh, nuclear power and nuclear uh, weaponry was developed, so it's one of the most polluted places on Earth. Um, but it's still a fun place to visit. I encourage you to do it anyway. Um, and uh, the LIGO laboratory 
is part of the LIGO scientific collaboration, which has grown to be over a thousand scientists from 80 institutions, 50 countries, 15, this is big science now. Uh, when you get to big science, you no longer show a picture of a, of a thousand smiling faces, you just show the logos. Um, but uh, the logos are here actually, and so here's Caltech and here's Stanford. Stanford's been involved since the very, very, very beginning and has played major roles in many, many aspects of developing the LIGO detectors. Um, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, and so I'm not going to tell you much about how the LIGO detectors work. In fact, there are people in the audience who can t uh, talk uh, about it in greater detail than me. Uh, I'll just remind you that they're Michelson interferometers with the laser and a gravitational wave goes by and it stretches one arm and it squeezes the other arm and the arms are nice and long so that the strain produces a measurable uh, displacement of the masses on the order of 10 to the minus 19 meters. Okay, uh, and then we detect it, um, and we are limited only by the noise in the detectors. And here's a, the frequency spectrum of the strain equivalent noise. Uh, it's a you know a spectral density, so it's in units of uh, strain per root hertz, and it ranges from 20 hertz to to a few kilohertz. And it goes really really lousy at low frequencies due to all the motion of everything around uh, in the material and the environment. Um, and it gets worse at high frequencies because um, the laser uh, uh, starts getting resolved into individual photons and the quantum shot noise of the individual photons shows up as noise at higher frequencies. You can see lots of spectral lines. Uh, the ones you can see are all well understood. They're things like um, the, the wire, the, the fibers that are used to hold up the mirrors have, um, uh, make these lines over here, these violin modes. Uh, there's 60 hertz in multiples that somehow get in and um, there are calibration lines. So all the lines are understood and can be modeled and don't really disturb our ability to detect gravity gravitational waves very much at all. Um, we've been operating the, the LIGO detectors now for quite some time, on the, almost 20 years. For the first 10 years, or in the 2000s, uh, we operated the initial LIGO detectors, uh, and for 10 years we observed and observed nothing, detected nothing other than noise. Um, that didn't dissuade us. Uh, we knew how to build a better detector. We spent five years uh, building and installing uh, the advanced LIGO detectors. We turned on in September of 2015, detected our first event a week or two after that. Um, and we have detected a bunch of events since then. This is our first observing run. Our second observing run ended in uh, August, and I'll be telling you about some of the results from these runs. Um, gravitational waves are emitted by anything, including my, my fist right now, but I'm pretty weak gravitational wave detector. Uh, um, but any kind of extremely energetic, strong, um, uh, quadru accelerating quadrupole moment will produce gravitational waves. I will be focusing on the ones that we've detected so far, which come from binary black holes and binary neutron stars. We are also looking for one of each, neutron star orbiting a black hole, or vice versa. Uh, other sources would be uh, spinning neutron stars like pulsars. We're only sensitive to them in our galaxy, whereas these objects are usually very far away in a galaxy very, very far away. Uh, spinning neutron stars would produce continuous gravitational waves. Core collapse supernova in our galaxy would produce beautiful, very short duration gravitational wave bursts. And ultimately, we hope to find gravitational waves from the early universe as well. And that will be uh, quite a challenge. Um, I'm going to focus on the uh, compact binaries. So um, compact uh, binaries, binary neutron stars and binary black holes are of course really interesting. In the case of black holes, uh, it's telling, telling us about general relativity. All these come from very massive stars that have collapsed, we think. Uh, so um, uh, the binary black holes will tell us quite a lot about uh, general relativity and about the properties of gravitational waves in general. And binary neutron stars, that's much more complicated. And I'll have more to say about that shortly. In all cases, what you have, and maybe I'll just illustrate it, here's the waveform, uh, which is, uh, starts out being a, a sinusoid uh, sweeping up in frequency as the, so as the sources orbit each other, lose energy by gravitational radiation, um, fall into smaller um, orbits, move faster, so the frequency 
um, picks up and the amplitude picks up as well until finally there's a merger. And maybe the best way to see that is with one of these little videos. Let's see if I can get one of these little videos to work. So this is actually not an artist's conception. This is a supercomputer simulation. It's a solution to Einstein's uh, field equations uh, numerically. It's a very non-trivial thing to be able to do. Here are the two black holes. That's, those are a cartoon and you can see them in spiraling. Here they're coming very close to, you can see the curvature of space. You can see the flow of space and the flow of time. Right about here they merge together from two black holes into a single one. If you've been following in the bottom, you see the in spiral wave part of the waveform, the merger part of the waveform, and then the ring down as this newly formed black hole emits um, uh, sort of a, a ringing uh, um, uh, signal um, as it uh, becomes quiescent. Um, so we observed for um, six months in 2015 and 2016. Uh, we observed a whole pile of events, this is the loudness of the signal, a whole pile of events that were consistent with our estimated background from instrumental noise. You're gonna have instrumental noise. Um, but then we found three events uh, that were all um, bi uh, consistent with being high mass binary black hole systems. Um, and they were standing out above the background, at least two of them. This one is way above the background. This is what our first five sigma event. Please don't ask me to explain what this is. I don't have the time. It's not interesting anyway. Uh, this guy also turned out to be a five sigma event and the, num uh, the nomenclature is gravitational wave discovered in 2015, September four, uh, 14th, a day that I will always remember, of course. Of course, this was Boxing Day, the day after Christmas. And this event, um, because it was not sufficiently significant to call it a five sigma or even a three sigma event, happens to be a two sigma event in statistical significance. So we called it LIGO Virgo Trigger. Terrible name, sorry about that. Okay, three events from initial LIGOs, from the advanced LIGOs first observing run. The first one was the loudest, it was spectacular, got us one of these little things. And um, uh, you've probably seen this plot lots of times, so I won't belabor it. Here's a time frequency spectrogram, and here's two tenths of a second. Okay, and here the signal is seen to sweep from th around 30 hertz to 500 hertz, 400 hertz uh, and then die away. And that's exactly what we were looking for. Um, and again, it corresponds to the in spiral and then the merger and then the ring down of the final black hole. And what you can see over here is that the velocity of these stars went from a third of the speed of light to two thirds of the, of the speed of light before you stopped calling it a velocity anymore because they merged together. Um, uh, so that's pretty good. Stellar mass objects, the size of Palo Alto, orbiting at, the, at two thirds of the speed of light before they smash together. That's pretty good. Um, and uh, here's the distance in uh, separation in, in Schwarzschild radius down to one Schwarzschild radius. These three events are kind of interesting in their own way. Uh, they're all black holes, <laughs> as far as we can tell. They're all high mass systems. As the, if the black hole masses are larger, get larger, that means that their intrinsic amplitude is higher because mass is the source of gravity. So the higher masses produce higher amplitude gravitational waves. And these are, st these are standard sirens. They're, they're not standard candles, they're standard sirens. They not only have well-defined um, luminosity or energy release, they have well-defined amplitude, like sound if you like. So we call them standard sirens. So we know from how loud they are, how far away they, they must be. Um, so the more massive a system is, um, the more, the louder it is. Also, the more gravitational radiation, therefore, it emits, uh, and therefore, the quicker it loses or, um, energy and orbital angular momentum, and uh, the faster it um, inspirals and sweeps from low frequencies to high frequencies, and the shorter it lasts in the LIGO band. Okay. Uh, furthermore, uh, the larger the mass, the bigger these Schwarzschild radii are, and that means that they will, um, uh, they're further away when they start to touch than lower mass systems. And uh, by Kepler's laws, that means that when they touch, they're, t they're orbiting at lower frequencies. Okay? So a higher mass system is higher in amplitude, sweeping faster in the band, and then it merges. This happens to be a Lorentzian, which I, I know all of you uh, know and love. Uh, this Lorentzian ring down uh, happens at lower frequencies. Lower mass systems have lower amplitude. This one happens to be closer. <laughs> Sweeps over a longer period, lasts longer in band, over a second in our band, and merges at higher frequencies. 
Okay, so that's how we can, um, by observing these waveforms and observing the frequency evolution of them, we can measure the masses or some combination of the masses. And um, this illustrates that, but I think I already said it. So we um, uh, measure the masses. Uh, here's M1 and M2, where M1 is greater than M2, so that's why this is grayed out. Uh, and you can see that our highest mass system, uh, we mainly see the merger in the sweet spot of our sensitivity. And the merger tells us the t what the total mass is. Whereas for the other systems, we observe the in-spiral, more of the in-spiral, and the in-spiral is governed by this weird combination of the masses, the so-called chirp mass. It's something like the product of the masses rather than the sum of the masses. And so what we measure well in these contours is the product of the masses, something like that. So that's why you see this sort of hyperbolic kind of locus. And we measure the mass ratio poorly. Um, we can also measure the spins. They have a subtle effect on the phase evolution. And the spins are interesting. If they're aligned with the um, orbital angular momentum, which they might be if both stars formed uh, in, from the same swirling gas cloud that formed the mass of stars, that supernova and formed the mass of black holes, um, it, then they're, they're, uh, their spins would be roughly aligned with the orbital angular momentum. On the other hand, if their spins are not aligned with the angular momentum, then there's a spin-orbit coupling, similar to what you see in the hydrogen atom. And that spin-orbit coupling will torque the orbital plane. And as it torques, torques the orbital plane, we'll see something face-on, edge-on, face-on. It'll be modulated. And um, we can sense that modulation and measure um, the, uh, the, uh, this torquing and measure the uh, uh, spin and the precession of the spin uh, very poorly. <laughs> very poorly unless we have very high signal to noise ratio. So for our, uh, this is basically telling you that the two objects before they merge have spins that are maybe mostly pointing a opposite to the orbital angular momentum, maybe perpendicular to the angular momentum, but it's pretty poorly measured. Okay. Um, from these standard sirens, we can measure the distances to these objects. And they're about, the, uh, these two, these lo two loud ones, were about 500 megaparsecs away, or about 1.3 billion light years away. Uh, and the, um, more, uh, the, the, less, um, the less loud one, more like a, 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 a gigaparsec away. Um, uh, of course, if they merged um, uh, uh, 1.3 billion light years uh, away, it means they merged 1.3 billion years ago, and the universe was a little bit younger, and maybe things have evolved a bit since then, and that's a good uh, astrophysical question to ask. Another interesting thing that happens is that when these two black holes merge together uh, is that um, the final black hole mass is less than the sum of the two original black hole masses. In the case of our loudest event, uh, 150914, um, by three solar masses. Where did those three solar masses go? They were radiated away in gravitational waves. That's an awful lot of energy to be radiated by anything, okay? Three solar masses is um, uh, about 10 to the 54 ergs, or 10 to the 55 ergs. Um, and um, uh, that's a lot uh, in gravitons. It's 10 to the 80 gravitons. And it corresponds to converting on the order of 4 or 5% of the total mass of the black holes into radiated energy. That's an extraordinarily high uh, radiation efficiency. Uh, for about 2 tenths of a second, uh, the luminosity uh, at peak, 3.6 times 10 to the 56 ergs per second uh, of this event, uh, briefly, for two tenths of a second, outshined all the electromagnetic radiation of all the stars and all the galaxies of the universe by a factor of 50 or so. Um, it was the most energetic e event ever observed by humankind since the Big Bang. Um, and we hadn't noticed these things before. We're only just now starting to notice these things. So here's, um, we discovered two more uh, in the second observing run, uh, and there's more to come, by the way. There's more to come. Um, so now we are starting to build up, if you like, a mass spectrum, okay? One event is a, you know, is a discovery. <laughs> a second event is a confirmation. A third event is a distribution. <laughs> a fourth event is background. And fifth event is um, calibration. So we're moving along. Um, 
Uh, here are all the binary, uh, are the black holes that are observed from X-rays um, uh, up until um, the era of gravitational wave astronomy, somewhere between five and 20 solar masses. Um, our black, the black holes that we observe are maybe because of Mal Malquist bias, they're more massive because the more massive ones are louder, easier to detect. Um, but it is still was surprising to see such high mass black holes. And we're not quite sure where they come from and we'd like to know. And the way to find out these things is to collect more events and start to piece together a puzzle the way astronomers and botanists do by filling in something like a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of, of black holes. And that's the kind of thing that uh, we're working on with more and more data. But I'd like to focus on this guy over here. This was the last one. We just observed it a couple of months ago. It was special for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason why it was special was that the, our, our sister detector in Italy, Virgo, had turned on just a week before. They were not quite at the sensitivity of the LIGO detectors, but they were on. And they saw it with a, stat, with a signal to noise ratio of on the order of four. Nowhere near as loud as, uh, as the, the more sensitive LIGO detectors, but they saw it, and it was in fact a good fit. So this was a great triumph for um, the, uh, the Virgo detector, and it started uh, the beginning of a, of a network of detectors, of gravitational wave detectors. And one of the reasons why it's important to have this uh, network is because different detectors will have different orientations with respect to the polarization of the gravitational waves. And by measuring the pattern of the amplitude of the signal in different detectors, um, correcting for the sensitivity of the detectors, um, you can um, infer the polarization of the gravitational waves. Remember I showed you earlier the gravitational waves are predicted by Einstein to be um, uh, tensorial, that is to say um, plus and cross polarization transverse to the direction of motion. Well, let's see if that's the case. We now have three detectors and can start to disentangle this. So there are other possible polarizations. I pointed out these two. These are the ones that are only, the only ones allowed in general relativity and they correspond here in this space-time uh, um, tensor uh, uh, to these uh, to the one one and one two and one, two one and two two components of the spatial three by three metric tensor, um, but there are other possible polarizations. Uh, here's just the spatial part of the tensor. You could imagine not just plus and cross, but you could also imagine um, x and y vector polarizations, and those vector polarizations would stretch and squeeze space longitudinally as well as um, uh, as well as um, uh, transversely, uh, and then also breathing modes in which uh, you're stretching space like uh, uh, in both x and y direction the same amount, um, as well as longitudinal, pure longitudinal modes in which you just stretch space along the z direction of motion. So there's interesting patterns here, and actually these two are degenerate in a quadrupole uh, antenna. So there's really five independent uh, polarizations possible. This would correspond maybe to a massive graviton, spin two graviton, that would have five helicities, not just two. And they have different, ant and the, our quadrupole antenna uh, gravitational wave detectors have different antenna patterns, sensitivity. Here are the two arms of maybe a LIGO detector. The LIGO detector is most sensitive to plus polarization at its zenith. It has no sensitivity to vector polarizations at its zenith. Um, or, or to scalar. Instead, the, it has more sensitivity either at 45 degrees with respect to the arms or at um, along the arms in the case of scalar type polarizations. So by, by we assume that these are the correct antenna patterns for uh, gravitational waves as described by general relativity, but what about these? Maybe they're possible and maybe these patterns are possible. You can do this now with three detectors. With two detectors, you cannot. Uh, but from the amplitudes, uh, the pattern of amplitudes, the ratios of amplitudes in the Hanford detector, here I'm putting little, little antenna patterns, uh, the Hanford, uh, the, these are quadrupole antenna patterns, uh, these, one, these for plus polarization, for Hanford, Livingston, and Virgo, um, gravitational wave hits all of them and produces a different response in all of them according to their antenna pattern. From this information, first available only on, October, on August 14, we can now um, actually 
disentangle some of the ambiguity and actually make the first experimental measurement uh, of the polarization of gravitational waves. And what we find is that tensor, uh, pure tensor gravitational wave polarizations is favored over uh, pure vector by a Bayes factor of 200. That means it's really strongly favored. Uh, pure tensor is strongly favored over pure vector or pure scalar. These are extreme. There's no good, there's no theories that predict pure vector or pure scalar polarizations. So these are pretty extreme cases. We will need five detectors in order to disentangle fully um, of the polarization. But this is the first time we've been able to make some statement about the polarization of gravitational waves from observation, not just theory. Okay, That's important to me. We can do something else with three detectors. We can locate the source in the sky very accurately. So, uh, for example, here, uh, the Hanford and Livingston and Virgo detectors, and the line between them is bisected by a circle on the sky, and the timing between Hanford and Livingston tells us that uh, the source must lie somewhere uh, on this circle. Okay? So, you know, these are antennas. They're not telescopes. We're not pointing in a place in the sky. We can't point, but we can use three of these antennas uh, in order to um, do timing localization, and we can use amplitude information to improve and find out where on this circle in the sky it is. And if we have three detectors that gives three circles on the sky, they'll, all, they'll intersect in two places, but from amplitude information, we can disentangle it and find the location of the source. Now, we're never going to find the location of the source with great accuracy because um, these waves have, uh, have wavelengths of you know, tens of thousands of kilometers or hundreds of thousands of kilometers. And just from uh, um, you know, basic optics, we know that the, res that the, um, uh, the um, accuracy with which we can locate sources in the sky uh, will be limited uh, by the wavelength of the, of, the, of, the, of the waves that we're detecting. And that corresponds to, in our case, on the order of a degree or so. We'll never do better than that even with many sensitive detectors and, and loud signals. In the case of uh, GW170814, we made a ring in the sky between, we do something more sophisticated than that, it's all Bayesian, but you can think of it as um, there's a ring in the sky between the Hanford and Living timing, Hanford and Livingston timing. Uh, the amplitude information locate, uh, localizes it to this, this banana shape in blue. And then we also have rings in the sky from Hanford and Virgo and Livingston and Virgo. And that gives us a sky localization that's way, way, way better than we've been able to do with any of our black holes. Why is sky localization important? We want to tell telescopes to point in that direction of the sky. This isn't a great localization. This is 30 square degrees. Okay, and your typical powerful telescope, you know, has a field of view of one square degree or less. Okay, so it'll take a while for one telescope uh, to go through that whole area and try to find something. But they did. We pointed dozens of telescopes at that direction in the sky and they looked for a signal and you know, they saw nothing. Well, these are black holes, you know? Black holes don't make light. Your telescopes are only sensitive to light, sorry. So that was very disappointing. Well, I should say it was disappointing to me, but because wouldn't it be great if black holes, when they merge together, did make light? But there are things that do make light when they merge together, and it happened three days later. So here, wow, okay. Well, it really started 130 million years ago. And 130 million years ago, this happened. Music! Wait a minute. I hate that. Can't even turn down the music. Two neutron stars orbiting each other. They're about to smash together. Don't worry about it. Ah! And when they do, they make a crap load of light and a huge amount of material. That's all right. Shut this thing up. Okay, and then comes the logo. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> Thank you, NASA. Let's go back. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna turn this off. And <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can show you that when they merge together, they make a lot of light. They make relativistic jets, which start shooting out. They eject an enormous amount of material, dynamical ejecta, and this is neutron-rich material, okay, flying out, and the um, gamma rays smash through this um, dynamical ejecta and make, and the, it actually prevents it from smashing through and produces what's called 
what people call a cocoon, uh, producing a, a weak gamma ray um, jet. At least that's the idea. Okay? So let's see if that's what we found. Well, in, on August 17th, I woke up to this. This is another time frequency spectrogram now spanning 30 seconds and from about 30 hertz on up to about 500 hertz. And maybe you see this thing coming all the way up like this. And that is low frequency sweeping to high frequencies. It's a chirp and it happens for a long time, which means this is a low mass system. We see the same thing in LIGO Livingston and nothing in Virgo. Okay, nothing in Virgo. Still, um, when I saw this, my heart pounded so hysterically that I couldn't see, I couldn't, I, I couldn't think straight. I got on the telecon, everybody else was like, I could feel, they were so excited uh, on the telecon, they were shaking so much that I, I swear I detected the gravitational waves that they were emitting. Um, uh, or maybe it was just me, I, I don't know, everything was vibrating. We were just, we couldn't believe what we saw. Actually, I'll be honest with you, this is not what we saw. This is what we saw in Livingston. In Livingston, over a second or two, here's that track, and here's this thing. What the heck is that? Actually, we know exactly what this is. This happens all the time in our detectors. It's a blip glitch. Our detectors have, this is it in time series, okay? In the ti filtered time series. A blip glitch happens probably about five or 10 times a day in the LIGO detectors. They're nasty things. We don't know how to get rid of them. They're almost, I think, almost certainly associated with scattered light. You know, we've got kilowatts of light circulating in our detectors, uh, 100 kilowatts, and some of it, maybe a part in 10 to the 15, you know, m like picowatts of laser light, get out, bounces off the shaking beam tubes, because it's all in a vacuum system, comes back, manages to find its way back in to our photo detectors, and makes this. We see these all the time, we got rid of it. In real time, took about 10 or 20 minutes, we just simply snipped it out. You can see the track underneath it, we knew something was real there anyway. Another problem, the Virgo data wasn't there. It was delayed, there was some network blip glitch or something. Uh, and, the, and the Virgo data wasn't there, so we had to scramble to get that. It took us a good 15, 20 minutes, and we were just in a huge rush because we wanted to point the telescopes. But there was something else. <laughs> there was also a gamma ray burst 1.7 seconds later. Okay, our heads were exploding, I really have to tell you. Um, uh, I was on shift that day, it was my job to tell the astronomers where to point. But by now, uh, I just, I couldn't even hold it in. Um, uh, so here uh, is our signal, once again, combined Hanford and Livingston. Um, and here, 1.7 seconds later, from Fermi, and also from Integral, um, SPIACS, um, a little excess. And that, you know, it's a, it's a, um, See, didn't I have more stuff here? Um, uh, it's um, it's uh, clearly a gamma ray burst, but it is kind of a, a wimpy one. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not like what we expected, because a gamma ray burst that we normally detect, there's, okay, once you've seen one gamma ray burst, you've seen one gamma ray burst. They're all different. Um, but, for the most part, when we detect gravitational waves, when Fermi detects gravitational wave uh, bursts, um, they come from maybe binary neutron star mergers producing a relativistic jet, and we're looking down that jet. And it's far away, like gigaparsecs away. Um, and it's, we can detect it from across the universe, from redshifts of one, two, and, and beyond, okay? Um, if this gravitational wave signal is as loud as we think it is, it is, this is a much, much closer thing. So much closer that this gamma ray burst should have been uh, three or four orders, orders of magnitude bigger than this. And it wasn't. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Um, the, the gravitational wave signal, um, we know that binary black holes, they're well modeled by these templates which come from, uh, you know, supercomputer simulations, solutions to Einstein's uh, um, uh, field equations. By, uh, these ones happen to be by, from the Simulating Extreme Space Times, SSXS, Numerical Relativity Group. Um, and they're, you know, typically short for binary black holes. For binary neutron stars, um, the waveform as predicted um, is a lot um, longer. 
Um, it starts out at low frequencies, but it sweeps to higher frequencies much, much slower because they're lower mass and um, uh, take a longer time. So it takes a, a while for this signal to um, uh, actually sweep from lower frequencies. You, we're actually playing it in the audio, but only the whatever, the dogs in the audience, whatever, I don't know what, uh, you know, the people who are sensitive to really low frequencies can detect it. When it's uh, approaching merger, um, even maybe it'll be right in the sweet spot of normal people's ears, and you might be able to actually hear the signal directly. Um, and actually, you know, this is a simulation of the signal, not the actual data, which would be noisy. Um, but when it actually does finally merge, um, it tells us where the mass of the system, the total mass of the system, ex uh, what it is extremely well. You know, I've spent 15 years waiting to hear that from nature. <laughs> and I did on August uh, 17th. So it was a real thrill to me. Um, this is the longest, loudest, and closest signal that we've ever observed in LIGO. Does the signal in the data match this prediction, this template? Well, once we adjusted for what the masses must be, yeah. Um, here's the signal, here's the data, and um, with the glitch removed, actually. Uh, and here it is with the signal removed. And it's nothing but noise. And um, so that um, tells us that at the lowest order, we can trust our template, which is based on general relativity. And it tells us, therefore, that general relativity is a good description of what's happening. Uh, so this is actually um, the strongest test of general relativity that has ever been done, because we're studying general relativity in the very, very strong field very highly dynamical, these things are moving at half the speed of light um, regime, where it's never been tested before, where as you know, general relativity is very nonlinear. You can't even solve the equations, they're so nonlinear. And yet, things work um, uh, pretty well. Uh, so that's remarkable. But more on that later. Um, we can measure the masses. The masses of the stars are measured mainly in this combination, this uh, chirp mass combination. So uh, the masses M1 and M2 are constrained to be in this, um, in this banana shape. Um, sort of that's the 90% uh, uh, confidence level band, something like that. Um, there's also the spins. They're hard to measure and they're roughly degenerate with the masses. So we can't measure the spins very well in this system, but we can uh, ask ourselves, what if the spins in these, black, in these neutron stars are typical neutron star spins? I mean, we detect neutron star, star spins from pulsars. Um, if they're typical, then their, their um, dimensionless spin amplitude in general relativity is small. And if it's small, then uh, we constrain the masses to be really in this region, somewhere between, so here's the two masses, somewhere in between the 1.1 to 1.6 solar masses, which are typical of pulsars, uh, of neutron stars uh, in binary systems. So this does look like a relatively typical system. There's about a half a dozen of these systems known in the Milky Way galaxy. This is not in the Milky Way galaxy. It's in a galaxy rather far away. So now that we have the masses, we can put them on this diagram and we see that we're finding a whole different population. The binary black holes are very massive, five solar masses on up. This is kind of a logarithmic ma solar mass scale. Um, the lower mass systems are um, neutron stars. Um, and um, only one neutron star has been well measured to be around two solar masses. These guys that are more than two solar masses, they actually have big error bars. So we really don't know what their masses are, but more on this in a, in a bit. But um, uh, what we do see in this uh, pattern emerging here, again, these are the neutrons, these are the black holes observed by X-ray, these are the black holes that are observed by Li from LIGO in gravitational waves. These are neutron stars usually observed as pulsars. Um, what we see is that these stellar mass black holes are typically above five solar masses. Uh, the neutron stars are typically below two solar masses. This thing over here is some kind of a mass gap, maybe. Uh, there are theorists who believe that there's good reasons for there to be a mass gap. We'd love to know whether we can fill in this region from observations in nature or not. And in fact, what it did happen to these two neutron stars when they merged together? Uh, here's the sum of the two masses. What is this object at the end? Well, it turns out that's kind of hard to tell with what we have now, with, with the information uh, we have now, and I'll try to explain why in a minute. 
Okay, uh, I mentioned that when these two neutron stars as opposed to black holes merge, they don't just merge together into a single black hole, they release an enormous amount of dynamical eject ejecta. Uh, even before then, they, uh, so this is totally ripping apart the neutron stars, it does leave behind stuck together some remnants, uh, which might be hyper massive neutron star, and then all this stuff might fall back in, or some fraction of it fall back in, and then that final object might collapse into a black hole. Uh, along the, uh, uh, as it goes, it releases a great deal of light and emits uh, gamma rays, gamma ray bursts. Um, that's an artist's conception, by the way. This is not an artist's conception. It's a visualization of another supercomputer simulation of what happens when neutron stars merge together, trying to put in as much physics as possible. So you can see they're starting to distort each other. This is called tidal distortion. So the gravity of this star is pulling on the near edge of the gravity of that star more than the far edge. So it's tidally distorting it, inducing a mass quadrupole moment that enhances the gravitational wave radiation and enhances the in spiral. So it happens. It, 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 um, it, it inspires even faster. They merge together, they spew out all this material. A lot of the material just, just flies out into the interstellar medium that um, you know, just pollutes the interstellar medium with very heavy um, you know, neutron-rich material. A lot of it, um, uh, so that becomes unbound, but most of it remains bound in, in some kind of an accretion disk which eventually falls in and turns whatever's in the center here, this hypermassive neutron star perhaps, perhaps into a black hole. And it powers a, um, a a relativistic jet. Um, these neutron stars are incredibly complicated and rich objects. I don't know if you appreciate just how amazing neutron stars are just as objects by themselves. Okay, they're formed, they're the dead remnants of massive stars that core collapse. Their outer layers blow away in supernova, leaving behind a dead neutron star. They're just an atomic nucleus, except instead of having 57 protons and neutrons. They have 10 to the 57 protons and neutrons. Okay, in, in such a system, um, all four forces of nature, the strong and weak um, uh, nuclear forces and electromagnetism and gravity are all at their most extreme, beyond anything that we can do in the laboratory. So, um, so there's an enormous amount of nuclear physics that one can do by studying the material inside of neutron stars. How do you study the material inside of neutron stars? The way particle physicists do it. Smash them together, okay? You don't need an accelerator, nature does it for us, just very infrequently. Um, and what happens? Well, we don't know because the, un, because the inner core of neutron stars um, are super nuclear densities. We really don't know the, um, uh, how they behave. So one way of, of asking the question is to say that neutron stars, well, maybe they have, you know, if, quark gluon plasma inside, maybe they have hyperons inside, strange quarks inside, all kinds of things. We're not quite sure because we've never, no one's ever studied um, uh, uh, nuclear matter at these kinds of densities. However, um, uh, these can all be, the matter can be characterized by an equation of state, which relates the pressure to the, um, uh, to the density. And these neutron stars are held together by gravity, pushing it in, trying to make it collapse, and the pressure is holding it up, okay? And so depending upon the nuclear equation of state, which is a property of nuclear matter that we dearly, nuclear physicists, would dearly love to understand, if we know that equation of state, we can tell, it tells us something about the neutron stars and vice versa. So for example, if neutron stars have strange matter inside, that softens the equation of state, allowing it to compress more, Okay, it will hold up less matter before it um, uh, collapses into a black hole. And so the equation of state produces a mass radius relationship, rela relation for a neutron star that looks sort of like these, these green curves for strange quark matter. And they never get up beyond about one and a half or 1.8 or so solar masses. We happen to know that there's one very well measured uh, neutron star mass at two solar masses. So um, this rules out strange quark matter, at least this equation of state, as describing um, uh, neutron stars. It's a pretty strange equation of state because of course it's got strange quark matter, but it actually is kind of normal because when you go to higher masses, you go to larger radii, like ordinary matter does. More mass, bigger. Right? And by contrast, in these more intermediate stiffness equations of state, um, when you have more mass, you should make a bigger star, but you also have more mass to compress the star gravitationally. And the balance between those two things produces 
um, in this case, for the case of these equations, this range of equations of state, produces um, neutron stars that have a radius of about 12 kilometers, whether the mass is a half a solar mass, up to two and a half solar masses. Okay. Still 12 kilometers. Okay, no matter what. And the very stiff equations of state can support even higher masses and bigger stars as big as 14 or 15 kilometers. That's a big neutron star. The question is, what are neutron, what is the mass, there's only one mass radius relation, there's only one nuclear equation of state, which one is it? Okay, um, wh the way to tell is to see whether, you know, the more massive, the stiffer equations of state will have um, more, um, uh, uh, will produce larger uh, stars. That means that they will hit each other uh, when they're further apart or at lower frequencies. So to see where, um, where the merger happens, uh, you want to see uh, uh, the frequency at which the merger happens, and that tells us about the radius uh, of, the, of, of these neutron stars. But here's the problem. In this simulation, this is just a simulation, here is um, uh, the, freak, the, uh, the, the um, amplitude versus frequency, or the spectral amplitude density versus frequency for the gravitational wave signal. Um, it sweeps from low frequency to high frequency like the ones I showed you earlier. It actually falls, even though the amplitude increases, because the time spent in a given band uh, falls because it spends less, you know, it's sweeping from lower to higher frequency faster. Uh, and about a second before, you might start seeing this deformation, this tidal deformation, um, and that will distort this signal. And then when they finally smash together, that's tidal disruption. And this might be the signal of a hypermassive neutron star that's resonating with body modes at two, three kilohertz, something like that. Um, and to see this would really tell us about the nuclear matter out of which uh, this stuff is made. But here's the problem. Here's our noise curve. It rises. And all this is happening below our noise. That is, we're really not resolving it. We're barely resolving any tidal deformation at all. In fact, our tidal, uh, until we have better detectors, our um, we're, we're, we have a hard time measuring uh, the tidal deformation or tidal disruption. What we have for the signal from, for GW170817 um, is just barely a hint that there is some tidal deformation between 100 hertz and about 7 or 800 hertz. Just barely some information. And that allows us um, to limit the tidal deformability of these stars. Here are some equations of state. These are the stiff ones corresponding to bigger stars, less compact stars. Here are the soft ones corresponding to very compact stars. And the, the color is uh, the consistency with the LIGO data. And what we see is that we're consistent with soft or intermediate black holes, uh, neutron, uh, nuclear equations of state, corresponding to neutron stars with radii less than 13 or 14 kilometers. So we're starting to contribute to learn about the, uh, the, the nuclear equation of state. Okay, um, I'm running out of time. I wanted to talk, oh, let me just say a few more words, okay? Um, this is my favorite slide, actually, because I'm a physicist. Uh, <laughs> Okay, first thing we've learned is that the gravitational wave signal is really fully consistent with general relativity over thousands of cycles. Is it consistent with your favorite beyond GR theory? I don't know. Right now we've only compared it to general relativity. Okay? The gravitational wave polarization has been measured for the first time. Weekly, but measured for the first time, and it is consistent with being tensorial, plus and cross, not at least pure vector or scalar, these extreme um, alternatives. Okay, uh, but measured for the first time. The tidal disruption, if it's there at all, is weak. That tells us that the nuclear equation of state is not very stiff. And it tells us that neutron star radii are less than 14 kilometers or so. Here's another thing. The gravitational waves and the gamma rays arrived within two seconds of each other. Now the gamma rays traveled at the speed of light. Eh, maybe a little bit less because there's an interstellar median. Essentially the speed of light. For our 40, from 40 megaparsecs away, that's um, 1.3, that's 130 million light years. So the gamma, the gamma rays travel for 130 million years before they got to us. And the gravitational waves got to us 1.7 seconds before that. That tells us that gravitational waves travel at the same speed as light to one part in 10 to the 15. Now Einstein would say, 
yeah, I told you that 100 years ago. <laughs> to which I would say, yeah, that's what you told me, but I found that it's true. And I didn't know that, and you didn't know that, until August 17th of this year. Um, also, by looking at the phase evolution, the frequency evolution, we see no evidence of dispersion. Dispersion might exist if these waves were carried by massive gravitons, which have a de Broglie, relativistic de Broglie dispersion relation. No evidence of that. That tells us that graviton, if it, if it has any mass at all, it's very, very small, consistent with zero. Okay? We were also able to test Lorentz invariance violation. Uh, we see no evidence of that. It's constrained to one part in 10 to the 13. Here's another thing. The, for the last, I don't know, thousand or so years of their travel, uh, their 130 million years of travel to get here, the gravitational waves and the light fell into the gravitational potential well of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay? Um, that's sort of like, you know, Galileo dropping a stone and a wooden ball from the Leaning Tower of Pisa and finding that they fell at the same time. Except nature did it with gravitons and photons. And we got to observe it. We tested the equivalence principle in a totally new way. It's really the Shapiro delay for the experts in the audience. Um, uh, we can also test up that the gravitational lensing of the photons and the gravitons are also the same to a very good level of accuracy. Um, but for the astronomers, we need to see whether any light other than gamma rays were released. So we had to find the source in the sky. And uh, to, if we could find the source in gravitational waves, in X-rays and gamma rays, and in optical, ultraviolet, and infrared, and in radio, and maybe even in neutrinos, that's what I call multi-messenger astronomy. So let's look. Let's see if I can get this to work. Did we see... Uh, let's turn this off. Um, so let's see, here is this localization from Fermi, the localization from Integral, the localization from the LIGO detectors, from the Virgo detector, which is interesting, I'll tell you more about that. Let's zoom in here. Oh, um, that's a big patch of sky. Look, there's a bunch of very massive galaxies in that patch of sky. Let's see if we can find anything in that little patch of galaxies. How about this one? This one is called NGC 4993. Anything new there? Let's see. Um, we located the source in the sky to about 28 square degrees in three dimensions, so we also knew it was 40 megaparsecs away. Virgo didn't detect anything. That told us that here's the LIGO ellipse, that told us that we must have been in a null in the Virgo antenna pattern. The, all of our, these quadrupole antennas have these uh, antenna patterns with nulls in them. LIGO does just like Virgo does, but fortunately it wasn't in a null of the LIGO detector, but it was in a null of the Virgo detector, which allowed us to locate the source in the sky really well from the LIGO, from the Virgo non-detection. Okay? Um, that told us um, that uh, uh, let's see, what do I want to say? Oh, the three-dimensional localization told us that it's about 40 megaparsecs away, and 40 megaparsecs is essentially a redshift of zero. So on this redshift versus energy release, uh, gamma ray energy release plot, and here's all the short gamma rays and long gamma rays, uh, many of them that have been observed and whose distance has been measured, or redshift has been measured. Here's our guy. It is the closest and dimmest gamma ray burst ever observed. Well, dimmest with a redshift ever observed. Um, we'd like to understand why. Um, I'm running out of time. Here's another really cool thing we hope we can detect. We could hope we could find. Um, all this dynamical ejecta is neutron rich. Um, uh, it probably produces very high mass atoms, like gold and platinum and uranium and plutonium and those kinds of things. In fact, here's the periodic table and there's sort of a concordant picture of where all these atoms come from. So the lightest, hydrogen and helium, uh, were produced in the Big Bang and maybe a little bit of lithium. Um, and um, uh, the intermediate ones here come from exploding massive stars. That's what we're made of. We're stardust. Everybody knows that. Um, but all these heavier elements, um, we're not quite sure where they came from, but maybe a very good um, uh, a possibility is that they come from um, uh, 
uh, merging neutron stars, like the one we just saw. Um, here is the cosmic abundance of the heavy elements in terms of mass number. And really, you can't explain these very high mass things from supernovas, from exploding massive stars. It really falls short by a factor of two or three. Whereas here, and here it is a close-up of this region over here, and these guys modeling the process by which this dynamical ejecta produces heavy elements through rapid process nucleosynthesis, our process nucleosynthesis, um, these, these dashed and dotted lines here are different models that semi-quantitatively describe the um, uh, spectrum of the solar abundance of these heavy elements in the solar system. The, the abundance of these heavy elements in the solar system. So maybe we're onto something. So we really got to find this thing. Um, I already ran through this. Um, we uh, looked at that. I ran it all the way to, the, um, to that NGC 4993, that galaxy right over here. Is there anything there? Oh, got it. Okay, the next morning, waking up, <laughs> I uh, woke up to um, uh, this picture. This is a new star in a galaxy far, far away, 40 megaparsecs away. Um, that wasn't there before. Um, and furthermore, um, a lot of other people saw it too. I think Swope and DLT saw it first, uh, and now, you know, just after a few hours, uh, and this was like eight hours or so after uh, the signal um, and after the gamma ray burst. Uh, so here is a sort of the gravitational wave signal and the gamma ray burst, and some number of hours later, um, we um, all this optical and infrared and ultraviolet poured in, and even uh, eight days later, uh, the Chandra X-ray space telescopes uh, saw it. But it took eight days to see the X-rays, okay? And the light curves are, are shown there. Um, we have seen light at every wavelength. Ultraviolet, infrared, and radio. Even in the radio, uh, it just started to rise about 10 days uh, after the merger. Um, that allowed us to identify the host galaxy from its uh, from that host galaxy, and from the fact that we measured the gra from the gravitational waves for for it to be 40 megaparsecs away from the host galaxy, we know the redshift, and now we can put it on a Hubble diagram. So here's the distance, 40 megaparsecs. Here's the redshift or the recessional velocity over here. Uh, and look, it lies right on the uh, line that we expect for a constant uh, um, nearby Hub uh, Hubble um, parameter. Um, here is the posterior probability distribution for the Hubble parameter, 60, 70, 80, and 90. This band over here is the Hubble parameter as measured by the Planck satellite. Uh, that, is, that is from cosmic microwave background. This band is from nearby supernova, nearby being within a hundred, couple hundred megaparsecs, okay? Uh, they're both pretty si precise, much more precise than us, and they disagree with each other. Oh, we would dearly love to settle that disagreement. Right now we can't, with one event, we can't. I am at the end, almost, or at least I should be. Um, <laughs> Uh, the su the uh, star went from not there uh, to bluish uh, to reddish, just as you might expect from uh, models called uh, kilonova models that I don't have time to talk about, it, but you can ask about it later. Is there any evidence of heavy element production? This is kind of hard to see, but here um, is a spectrum uh, at infrared wavelengths. This is 10 microns up to uh, 24 microns. Uh, no, sorry. Um, this is in angstrom, sorry. 10,000 angstroms uh, up to 24,000 angstroms. Uh, the, these are the data in these, um, these, this gray, and then there's a smooth fit to it um, in this black. Um, these are regions in which the atmosphere makes it very difficult to measure um, uh, the spectrum. And the red is a model of uh, a, a binary neutron star merger uh, and the production of he heavy elements, um, you know, heavy R process elements um, in that regime. The agreement is not great, but it's not terrible either. It's semi-qualitatively um, uh, there. Uh, these two peaks over here are associated with uh, lanthanides, neodymium, and the, and the like. Even, you know, gold and platinum. So um, it looks like this might be the site, or a site, for the production of heavy elements. Is it the site? Is it where most of the heavy elements come from? Well, we can look at the quantity of ejecta and then we can look at the rate of mergers. We measured the rate of mergers based on one event. <laughs> okay? Hey, you, you take what you get. 
okay, based on one event. And um, it's in the right ballpark. It's really in the right ballpark. This is consistent with explaining all of my wedding ring. I mean, I'm stardust, but this, this is neutron stardust. <laughs> um, wow, okay, I am so out of time. Um, all I want to do is say, by skipping a whole pile of slides, that the future of gravitational wave astrophysics is bright. Thank you very much. Congratulations uh, for the discoveries. Congratulations for a wonderful talk that conveyed not just the physics, but also especially the excitement of this business. Um, I'm still trying to calm down. Still calm down. Yeah, okay. I, I have a high, I'm a high Q oscillator. Yes, but it's only a few hour results from that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I'm going to start with the first question. Uh, think five years down the road. What is the most exciting five thing you're looking road. forward to? <laughs> You didn't have time to tell us. No, I didn't have time to tell you about it. Okay. Uh, five years down the road. Um, uh, it's almost too much to ask to, to detect the gravitational waves from the, the, from, the, um, from the inflationary period of the Big Bang. That's a long shot. It would be really great. Um, I hope to see a lot more, of course, black holes and neutron stars. Maybe that's not so exciting. Maybe it is. Depends on what we learn from it. Um, but um, what I'm really uh, hoping for is something that we have, of course, never even thought of because we're opening up the sky to a totally different and new form of, of radiation and the unexpected will be the most exciting thing for sure. Other things, okay. Have you guys ever seen that movie Beetlejuice? It's a great movie, you should see it, okay? It's about a ghost and you, you the ghost, um, to summon the ghost, you say his name three times. Okay. Now there is a star out there that's gonna go supernova in our galaxy any minute now of the same name. Okay? But please, we're not up right now, we're down right now, we're, gonna, we're upgrading our detectors. When we come back up in the fall of 2018, you can say that name three times. Okay? Don't... Okay? I'm a, I'm a little bit superstitious um, about this and nothing else. Um, and the point is, is that a core collapse supernova in our galaxy, when we detect it, is going to give us bucket loads of science. And I'm really looking forward to that. Okay. Now, we've got uh, a few questions and some anxious people outside who want to use this auditorium. So let's have a few. Uh, yeah. Um, that a few of your slides touched on this, but just so it's crystal clear, to what extent are there experimental measurements of gravitational wave events that stand alone completely on the experimental technique side without uh, the theoretical interpretation. So if the theoretical interpretation changed, you, you, you state, I'm sorry, this event is, is as I presented. You know, um, we do use um, our, our solutions to Einstein's equation as templates to pull weak signals out. If the signals were completely not describable by these templates, well, the template-based search would miss him, but we have non-template-based searches, which are less sensitive. Templates really help, um, which would find these things. Um, our detections stand independent of the theory. They are real measurements of strain, and they are from extraterrestrial sources. Okay? Extraterrestrial strain. We call that gravitational waves. We think about it in the context of general relativity. You don't have to. This is extraterrestrial strain. Okay. Good year. That thing must be making lots of xenon also. That's actually lots of what? Lots of xenon. Lots of xenon. Oh, yes. Just, yes. Uh, You're I'm set, just, Giorgio. You're yeah, set. Yeah, You're set. No, seriously, I mean, this is great. Yes. Um, actually, if you go back to your slide, what is it, 40 or something? <laughs> 40? Um, sorry, I, I took notes. Um, no, but, uh, so, uh, in your... Um, 
equation of state, it seems like you'd like to be able to, do, to go at higher frequency in some sense. Does this mean that this is a new window opportunity for, for the old bar detectors? A bar? <laughs> I'm going in a weird direction, but I'm right. wondering. Okay. Right? So there That's do exist gravitational wave detectors, which are bars, and which uh, are most sensitive up at 1,000 hertz, or even, you, can, you know, the smaller they are, the higher frequency they respond to. Yes, um, um, their sensitivity of the best cryogenic bars in the, in the world today is toward of magnitude higher than this. So that's that doesn't mean you can't figure out how to do it, Giorgio, please. No, no, I understand. I don't know how to do it. Peter. Peter. No, you, you need to improve the coatings on your mirrors and turn up the laser power. <laughs> He's taking a different approach. Thank you very much. We will turn up the laser power, which is going to break our mirrors, but we know how we're, going to, we're working on it. Um, we do believe, and look, this lef level here is 10 to the minus 23. This, you know, um, here's where we're um, really shooting. Uh, I got to go to slide 902. Um, this is 10 to the minus 24 and 10 to the minus 25. This is the best we think we can do with a four kilometer long detector like the ones in the vacuum tubes that we've built and we want to use. We could start skimming 10 to the minus 24 and even better. Um, but with longer and bigger detectors, we could go uh, uh, to a couple, of, a couple times 10 to the minus 25. Um, that's what we're trying to do. If you have the money for us, we will take it. Okay, this is not going to be cheap. There'll be a silver collection after the... Uh, <laughs> Ray Weiss has said that he's worried that the charge on the end mirrors um, might be responsible for some of your excess noise. What actions are you taking during the shutdown to reduce that charge? Gary knows more about this than I do. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, so one thing we do do is discharge. Our, 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 um, uh, our mirrors. Um, remember, this is kind of a random noise. It's not going to, um, unless you know, some very large charge object whizzes by, this is not going to produce a, a, a false event like this. Um, but um, the charge um, can be, the way we've been reducing the charge, besides for, you know, what didn't work was flashing UV on, on it. That didn't work. Um, what does work is simply reversing the, 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 um, the, the, um, the, the sign of the electric field. Um, and then it builds up again, and then we reverse it, reverse it again. And what we found it, when we do that, when we, um, when we reverse it, so we're sort of kicking all the charges out, um, it doesn't change the noise at all. Are you going to coat fibers of the mirror with any conductive material? That's what we'd like to do, but if you do coat our mirrors, it ruins their cue. And we don't want to ruin the cue. So we have to figure out a better way. Now in the future, we'll probably go to cryogenic detectors made out of pure crystalline silicon. We'll have a different charging problem, but maybe we'll be able to solve it. Yeah. I'm going to take one last question, and the rest of them will have to be outside. You said people outside. Right at the back there. Yes, uh, I'd be very interested uh, to know, are you uh, planning to, uh, if, in future events, uh, give some sort of announcement that would allow uh, amateur astronomers to look for novas? Yeah, we're, we're such conservative bozos. Well, I'm sorry. We're, just, we're such conservative people that for our first two observing runs, we were hesitant to send out low latency alerts, point here, um, uh, to just any old you know, person. Uh, instead, we set up memoranda of understanding with several dozen of our close um, uh, um, astronomer friends. Um, and we promised that after observing four events, we would stop being so closed about it and send those alerts out to everybody. Well, guess what? We've observed six events, and there's more coming, by the way. In the start of our third observing run in um, uh, fall of 2018, our low latency alerts are going out to the public. Promise. By the way, all of our data associated with these events are available. LIGO Open Science Center, LOSC.LIGO.org. Analyze away. Find echoes. <laughs> well, uh, we have finished at this point. Uh, say, Alan might be able to take some more uh, questions outside. Let's thank Alan again once again for one. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks very much.